by Accountants World. We're joined today by Brian Tankersley, Director at K2 Enterprises, and he'll be speaking on robotic process automation and AI concepts for accounting professionals. I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm Div Bansali, Vice President of Marketing at Accountants World, and I'm joined by Tom Provine, also from our marketing team. We're thrilled to have you with us today and thrilled to be with Brian. Uh, I know many of you have heard Brian speak in the past, and uh, he's really an exceptional speaker on accounting technology. And, and today is going to be challenging us to look ahead to uh, what's coming in terms of robotic automation and AI. So looking forward to getting that started. Before we uh, go into uh, Brian's presentation, just a couple of housekeeping items. A um, couple of tips on GoToWebinar. You probably use the tool, but if you haven't recently, if you're looking for the control panel and you don't see it, look for the orange arrow that allows you to expand or hide the panel at any time. You can select your audio options, whether you want to listen by computer audio or phone call by going to the audio tab. And if you have any questions for Brian, um, go ahead and send them in at any time using the questions tab. Make sure to click the send button after you type it in uh, so that we can see it. And Brian will answer them either during our poll breaks or at the end of today, oh, excuse me, or at the end of today's presentation. We do offer one CP for today's webinar. Um, and in order to receive CP credit, you need to be participating actively. What does that mean? Well, number one, it means responding to all of the poll questions during the webinar. First one will be coming up in just a minute here. Second is completing the survey at the end of the webinar. The survey launches after the webinar window is closed. If you don't see it, no worries. We'll send you a link to the survey by email afterwards. You just have to fill it out one time. And third, you need to be logged into the event for a minimum of 50 minutes. Um, CP certificates, will be emailed probably early next week or confirmation I should say will be emailed early next week after your eligibility has been confirmed. Also if you're not receiving emails from us about CP go ahead and add webinar at accountantsworld.com to your trusted email list to make sure that our emails get through to you. Also wanted to briefly speak about uh, our sponsor Accountants World. Um, many of you are familiar with the payroll relief solution. It's a, Accountants World's award-winning solution for live payroll processing. Um, and we are, uh, we are committed to making payroll as painless and profitable as possible. And you see on the right-hand side a quick bulleted list of some of the things that the time-consuming payroll tasks that we handle automatically on time and with guaranteed accuracy of calculation, uh, direct deposits, child care payments, payment of virtually all payroll taxes, e-filing of tax forms, and year-end processing as well. Um, you see some of the accolades that we've gotten there as well, and, and you can see our happy customers on review sites like Trustpilot and Captera. Um, so if you are interested in boosting your payroll practice, or if you're just getting payroll off the ground and are looking for an industry-leading solution to help you build your practice profitably, um, we'd love to offer you a free 30-minute demo uh, of payroll relief, it's no obligation. We'll walk you through the solution, answer any questions that you have, and figure out jointly if payroll relief can be a good fit for your payroll practice. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'll go ahead and launch the uh, first poll question right now, which is simply um, that I'd like a 30 minute one-on-one -on -one consultation to learn more about payroll relief and how it can make my payroll practice more profitable. So if you're interested, go ahead and uh, select yes. If not, go ahead and select no. Either way, go ahead and select an option. Make sure to hit submit. And a reminder that voting in this poll question is required in order to earn CP credit today. So I see over 80% of you have gone ahead and voted at this point. Let's go ahead and get that over 90% and then I'll go ahead and close this out in just a few more seconds. All right. Going once, going twice, and we'll close that out now. All right, thanks for voting in that. Let's go ahead with our material for today. Um, before I turn this over to Brian, just wanted to, to present a brief bio about him. As I mentioned, he's a director at K2 Enterprises. Um, Brian has been long recognized as a thought leader in public accounting technology and in fact has uh, presented and spoken in all 50 states 
on trends in emerging accounting technology. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and present Brian Tankersley. Hi everybody, and uh, thanks for thanks for coming today. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I'm I'm very I appreciate that kind introduction, Div. Uh, you know, it's it's always a pleasure to uh, to speak to your audience about about emerging topics and and other pieces through here. You know, the world of technology really is changing, um, and you know, we heard a lot about cloud for the last 10 years or so, and most of you have, have adopted cloud in some some fashion or form. Uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have, uh, we don't have issues, uh, but it does mean that, um, you know, it does mean again that we, um, that we still have to uh, figure out how we're going to, how we're gonna adopt the new technology and how we're gonna make it work. And so I've got some questions for you that, that'll work in through that. But um, the next wave that's coming is where we let the technology do the work, okay? And where, where a lot of the jobs that were lost in, you know, and have been lost in the past have gone offshore. You know, most of us have heard about, uh, you know, people's, people's jobs going offshore. Uh, now, what's going to happen is a lot of those jobs that went offshore are now going to be replaced by technology, okay? And some of the technologies that are going to replace them include robotic process automation, artificial intelligence. We'll talk a little bit about bots and chatbots specifically. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about a new kind of solution uh, that lets you, it's called low-code, no-code. So this is designed for non-programmers to be able to use um, and, and accomplish many of the things that formerly required you to, to write a program to do things. Uh, so these solutions are out there. They're quite available. They, uh, they go forward. And again, they're very, very helpful uh, within there. Now, you can't do everything that you can do on a low-code, no-code basis, but you can do a lot. And, and that's, the, that's the important part is that, uh, you know, you, do, you, can't so, you can't solve every problem with them, but you can solve many problems that are out there. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about what kinds of tasks are suitable for some of your early automation efforts and what things are going to require a little more sophistication. Anyway, I got a little bit of session description here, and I think you all have seen that before, uh, but we're going to talk as we look at our four major topics in here, and I've got just a bunch of slides in here. We're not going to go through every slide in excruciating detail, but we are going to uh, cover these four major areas, and then uh, you've got the slides as reference. So we'll talk about some of the emerging, emerging technologies, trends, some guidance, innovative applications, and technology to consider. Um, as we think about the automation, one of the things that's really held us back is um, for individual companies in particular is where you don't have a lack, where you have a lack of scale, where you have, you know, have a small business, mid-sized business. Uh, historically, tools like artificial intelligence and robotic process automation have been limited to um, have been limited to uh, the enterprise companies, so companies that have north of a billion in revenue, north of 2,500 employees. However, the automation is getting better and better. And cloud applications now are start. You're starting to be able to link them together with tools like Zapier and C Data and others. Um, we have a lot of uh, a lot of IT departments that are overwhelmed with cybersecurity, and so um, we've also had a lot of technology that's been oversold by early market entrants. Uh, that so people got soured on them and didn't trust them before they actually ever worked. Now let me just show you here. This is the Gartner hype cycle for emerging technologies. Okay, and I want to zoom in on it here for a second because I think it's important to look at this because there's nothing in here that is, that they say is emerging that's going that they say was going to be achieved in the next two years. Okay, most of the things they have are two to five years out, and so these are some of the things you may be looking for. You know, 5G, deep learning, deep neural networks. Uh, uh, application-specific integrated circuits or chips for deep neural networks and virtual assistants, and so those are things that are um, that are adoptable um, in most cases now. Uh, as we look at those, many of those are five to ten years out. And so, if you look at this, you look at some of these emerging technologies. Um, we have, you know, things like augmented reality and blockchain and uh, quantum computing and smart robots. Uh, you know, as we as we think about how we're going to use these technologies, um, we need to be trying things out over time to try to see what's going to work. We look at what's more than ten years out. Well, autonomous driving level four and level five. What are those? Well, level four means the vehicle can navigate itself anywhere on any um, on any road, okay? 
Level five means it can navigate anywhere, whether there's a road or not, okay? But notice with both of those, they say it's more than 10 years out. Now, wait a minute. Does that mean we shouldn't think about self-driving cars? No, doesn't mean we shouldn't think about them, but we need to acknowledge that they're not going to change our lives in that period of time. Also, I want you to see here, artificial general intelligence is up there as well. Now, we've talked a lot about AI or artificial intelligence where we solve little small pieces of things, okay? Uh, like the way I think about AI right now is it's very much like having a kindergartner that can help you with the task, okay? Um, it's not gonna accomplish things at the same level of proficiency as a, uh, you know, again, as a as somebody that that is a journeyman at their, and practicing their profession. OK, um, you know, that's a, you know, somebody that's that's at the at the cutting edge of what they're doing, uh, but they can accomplish some simple tasks. OK, so we have to figure out what those are and then start applying those in here. Again, this artificial general intelligence, I think that's a pipe dream. You know, it's 10, 10 plus years out, but that's where the a lot of the staff decision making and communication is going to be replaced by by computers, you know, and I don't know about you, but I mean, when I, you know, if you're one of the people that's had to hold people's hands while they're, while you talk to them about their business being in shambles because of COVID, you know, I want somebody to, I want somebody that can hold my hand and tell me it's going to be okay. I don't want to talk to some ATM that, that I pay money to. Okay. So as we're, as we're thinking about this now, there are some cultural issues again, that are going to hinder many of these things. And some of these things again, are going to be, are going to be well, well in the future. Now, uh, AICPA and CPA.com actually goes through and also uses the same kind of model here. Notice again, we start out with an innovation trigger. Uh, they put conversational AI there, we have smart robots. Then we have a peak of inflated expectations, and they say that deep learning is at the peak of inflated expectations. Now, down from there, we have blockchain and bots. Now, bots notice they're headed down into the trough of disillusionment, okay? Robotic process automation, though, is coming out of that. Big data's out, OCR's out, and software as a service is well past the, product, the plateau of productivity. And I think that's pretty accurate. Um, I actually had some input into, into that thing with Casey Johnson and some of the folks over there. Uh, but as we're, as we're thinking Thinking about this now, we're really going to focus on this guy, robotic process automation. And again, we're going to focus on artificial intelligence, where again, we're using bots and 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 other other intel other other things to to change our workflows out. Now, as we look at as we look at this, there is a you know this is from some of the work of Jeffrey Moore, um, where he talks about the adoption curve. And notice that there are some people that are innovators, early adopters, then early majority, late majority, and laggards. Okay, um, there will be risks that are going to happen, and there will be risks that your innovators and early adopters are going to face. And they're going some of that stuff's not going to come back. Some of that you know some of these things aren't going to work out. But if you don't take the risk, you're not going to get a chance to get the reward. Uh, so when we think about this, uh, we think about how we're going to leverage uh, transformational technologies. We first have to ingest as much data as we can. We'll talk about some of the tools for that. We'll then look at robotic process automation to replace some of the manual work we have to do. That then flows into data analytics. Then we have machine learning, uh, which again uh, requires usually more, a million or more records to do things. Uh, then we have artificial intelligence, and then we can augment intelligence and help us make better decisions. So these are things that are coming. Um, you need to think about, again, the, your emerging technologies, because it can be disruptive to your current business. So let's just give you an example. Um, I think that a lot of people that are doing the very simple low-end tax returns, uh, you know, your your person that has two W-2s and a and a house, okay? That tax return is gonna get done by TurboTax or some other product um, in the near term. Uh, you know, again, it, it's, it's not, you know, this stuff is gonna get further, further automated. And what that's gonna do then is that's gonna drive those people that are serving the interview, the interview prep market, they're gonna have to come up market into the more difficult stuff. And that's gonna drive down the margins for all the compliance things, okay? So, so you know, again, even if the stuff you do isn't gonna get, isn't gonna get displaced, stuff at the margins can get uh, displaced. And when that happens, that can have an impact on you because there can be new entrants that arrive as a result. Um, 
Now, there's a lot of FOMO, so you will hear a lot of hype. You know, I'm I'm actually attending the AICPA's blockchain symposium uh, next week, and you know, you you get invited to these things, and I'm looking forward to it. But you know, blockchain is one of those things that's been very hyped, and it's been very quiet lately. And part of the reason is we have to uh, we have to go in and actually develop the applications now that use this for that benefit. So these are some of our leading edge technologies. Again, uh, merging, you can see big data, big science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, cryptocurrencies, bots. Uh, we have 3D printing, robotics, drones. Um, as we now look at this though, um, we look at our emerging technologies, they're all based on three, three, the three different kinds of computing. Okay, the general computing that's floating point calculations, uh, that's like the normal uh, IBM compatible computers we've used for years, the Windows computers. We have graphics computing, uh, that's like what we do when we render videos or other things like that. Um, it does vector calculations instead of floating point math. And then we have quantum computing that optimizes for things. And quantum of course is emerging now all of this stuff the majority of it again is based on either big data or cognitive computing where we have computers trying to make decisions that humans would normally make now the intersection of big data and cognitive computing here is going to be data analytics and then as we start looking at some of our other technologies they kind of fit into this venn diagram now the venn diagram is not perfect but it's it's pretty good, and Randy and I labored over that for, <laughs> I bet we spent a day on that diagram. Uh, but it, it's, you know, again, it kind of shows where all the stuff is. Now, if we look at this, notice that we have bots in here that include, they use voice and vision and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And then we have machine, artificial intelligence, again, that intersects with that. So let's uh, go in and think about AI. And one of the first things we've got to understand here is that for a technology to be effective, we have to trust it, okay? And let's look at the Boeing 737 MAX. Uh, they actually had an, an, an automated anti-stall system, killed 346 people in two separate accidents where the plane basically went nose down into either the ground or the ocean, depending on which incident it was. Um, and there was a computer system that had a single point of failure um, that overrode the human commands. So humans will tolerate human error more than they'll tolerate machine error. Now, those planes are grounded. They've, del they've suspended deliveries. If you haven't seen it, I want you to Google pictures of the 737 factories because they've literally taken over the employee parking lots and put unfinished aircraft on the parking lots because they they've got so many that are that are un, that they just can't finish and can't deliver uh, because of the the ban. Now the good news is most of the um, most of our most of our different uh, aviation organizations now have either finished or are near finishing their recertification of these things of, of the planes. But unfortunately, COVID is hit, so now uh, they're not going to hit the they're not going to hit uh, the road anytime soon. Now, but again, for perspective. Every day, 3,287 people die in car and motorcycle crashes, but we're not looking to ban uh, airplanes, we're not looking to ban cars and motorcycles, okay? Uh, but but over 346 people in two incidents, we banned that, that airplane. And by the way, there's some problems with the 787 coming out now. So I wanna ask you a question. How do you feel about, um, how do you feel about the 737 MAX? And with that, I'll turn it over to Div and let him open up that poll. Uh, it's actually going to be uh, me that's going to be taking care of the poll questions today, uh, Brian. So, hi, folks. This is Tom Provine, who Div mentioned in the intro. Uh, so, this is the second of our five poll questions today. Uh, and it reads, how do you feel flying on the Boeing 737 MAX? No problem. The FAA and Boeing get these things right. I'm slightly more nervous about that airplane. I'm significantly more nervous and would not fly on it. And I'm not going to fly on it as long as COVID continues as a threat. So if you wouldn't mind answering that poll question. Uh, and folks, I don't know if Div mentioned it in the intro or not, uh, but just a reminder to exit out of the full screen presentation in order to answer the poll questions. Um, there's a slight glitch in, in GoToWebinar that we've seen where people who are in the full screen presentation, um, their answers might not be tabulated on GoToWebinar. So just exit out of the full screen presentation, answer the poll question, and then you can resume back in full screen. All right. Um, we have about 92% that have voted. All right, we're going to give it just another 15 to 20 seconds here. All righty. Okay, going once, going twice, and we will close the poll question. And let's share those results, Brian, quickly. 
All right. Uh, so we have 31% of people say I'm slightly more nervous about that airplane. 37% said I'm not going to fly as long as COVID continues to be a threat. 21% uh, said I'm significantly more nervous and would not fly on it. And then 11% of the people said uh, no problem. So uh, do you find that these numbers sort of jive with, uh, you know, the, the respondents and the people who see this presentation? I think it does, you know, and, and I will tell you that I'm in that 11 percent. I'm ready to go. OK, I'm I'm going stir crazy. I haven't been on an airplane since mid-February, as I was telling everybody coming in here, and I am ready to go. OK, but, you know, I got a nice gig here. I got a I got a great family. I get to see them, uh, but I really miss seeing people. And I think that's what a lot of us are missing. But we have to remember that when we automate, we have to let the humans take control and fix things, because when we do this, the, the machines will make mistakes. They will do exactly what we tell them to do. And when they do, they will make mistakes. So we just have to make sure that we we build that in as we're as we're figuring all this out. Now, with that, and that's that's part of my segue into robotic process automation, this is where, this is, again, some emerging thing where we have this notion of software robots, okay? Uh, it brings together a lot of different technologies, uh, programming, screen scraping. Uh, we It's kind of like macros. If you've ever used macros in Excel or Word, where you can go in and actually create a routine and then execute that routine over and over and over again to create repetitive things. Um, but, you know, we, so we have that, but you're not limited limited to just Word or Excel or compatible applications. You can do this on anything. Uh, so it's like a macro script that you can use against anything that you can interact with as on the computer. Uh, we can move data between applications. We can have event triggers. So when you add a new customer in Salesforce, you can have it, uh, you can go ahead and have it uh, key it into your app, your software and add something new to it. Um, so we have, um, we have optical character recognition where we can extract data. So we could take, uh, for example, my handouts and we could extract words from it. And then we could create, um, we could actually go through and create a Word document from that. Now, our first generation tools that were that were implemented were implemented by the enterprises back in the early 2000s. Uh, so those required an, a lot of time for programming configuration. The second gen tools do more unassisted learning um, and less upfront human intervention. So let me tell you a real Real story about something that really happened with uh, PPP. Um, a bank with which I'm familiar um, actually uh, didn't get many applications in in the first round because they didn't do that many small business loans. And so uh, they created uh, and they found out they had to get all the data into the SBA's uh, website. So what they did was they created a robotic process automation tool to input. And suddenly they were in, they input so fast that when the second round of PPP loans came up, uh, they were told uh, they, they got thousands and thousands and thousands in on the first instantly as soon as they turned it on because these robots can just key in as fast can get the data in much faster than humans ever could and so they actually were taken aside by the small business administration people said look we can't we can't let you turn in 10,000 applications in five minutes uh, because that's the speed at which they could get these things entered um, so we'll only let you turn in let's say a thousand or 1500 or 2000 loans uh, per day and that's all we're going to let you do because these poor people at these banks that don't have robotic process automation can't do this but for that reason a lot they had a very high percentage of folks or I believe they probably had a, their people that were submitted in the second wave probably had a much better chance of getting approved because they deployed robotic process automation so again those things are in here and they exist uh, now we we start out though with process automation again because adding this to a poorly designed process is never going to be transformational. Um, you're then going to move to rules-based process automation and optical character, character recognition. So many of you may have done this if you do income taxes, where you started out by having something, some kind of workflow tracking tool. Uh, you switched away from the paper slips and you moved to some kind of tool like um, some kind of tool to manage it. Um, then uh, we went to optical character recognition in here. Uh, so we then, we took that and we extracted the data instead of input it. 
Uh, so if you're thinking about that in the context of bookkeeping, maybe you're using a receipt bank, an auto entry, or something like that to, uh, to extract data from bills or invoices or other things. Uh, then you get into AI learning and API integrations. And then finally, we have, um, you know, as we think about this now, a lot of the first generation tools were very, very expensive. They were priced for the enterprise, where if you wanted to play in this area, you had to spend at least low six figures to get this done. That's not the case anymore. So the way, again, if we look at the how we climb through here, we start again with process tracking tools like workflow management, very similar to the way you can track the status of things through Amazon, keeps things from falling through the rules. Then we get to rules-based uh, follow-up, business process management, and other things like that. An example of that might be uh, might be if you're using one of the PBC automation tools uh, that will actually automatically follow up. I call it auto nag when somebody you have a PBC request and they don't respond within a certain number of days or they miss the deadline or something like that. Uh, then we have learning in here. So with that, you end up with robotic process automation, bot creation and training. That's what we're talking about here. And then finally, we end up with reasoning where we have AI and chatbots. So starting out with process tracking, again, this is where you just take things through each step of a process. And uh, as you're as you're thinking about this, um, it's a lot of times it's the first time you've gotten some of that operational data into structured formats. And so there's a huge business intelligence opportunity now to go through and look at how many transactions are in there and so forth. You know, uh, Accountants World actually does a great job of doing some of this kind of reporting with their dashboards and with their multi-company things. You know, I know when I look at when I look at the um, the presentation that they have on uh, doing client accounts payable, uh, it's a great great process tracking in there where you can see how many invoices uh, have been submitted by the client or how many bills have been submitted by the client. Then how many have you entered? Then how many are out there for approval? And then how many are due to be paid? You know that kind of tracking and reporting again is the core of this. The next thing then we get into rules-based process management. So maybe uh, we have an auto nag that we implement in there. But again, the, with this, uh, we we map our processes, we rationalize things, and then maybe if we have an maybe in our payables process we have an extra step. So if it's over ten thousand dollars, then we have to get two people to approve it instead of one or something like that. Uh, but again, that's that's the next piece. Then we when we get into enhanced process automation. You know, this will do things like let you read leases and get key terms out of them and it'll summarize those things in there um, it will go in and, and let you figure out who the people are in your video feed so you can identify the people that are there over and over again if you ever wondered how the card counters get kicked out of the casinos in vegas they use uh, artificial intelligence and uh, facial recognition in the video camera systems and so as soon as somebody that's banned walks in an automatic alert gets sent to security uh, then after this, we end up with cognitive process automation, where we can, again, we're doing data science and things like this. And that's a ways off for us. But this is what's happening today. This is why Netflix knows what movies you want to watch and Amazon knows what you want to buy, uh, because they've figured it out and they've used these predictive analytics and done enough A-B testing that they can figure out what works. Now let's look at when we think about this in the context of robotic process automation, here's a sample business process. By the way, this is out of a publication by um, called Embracing Robotic Automation During the Evolution of Finance by the Association of Chartered Accountants in Australia, the Chartered Accountants Association of New Zealand and KPMG. In here, we have the key point here is you have a seven step intercompany transaction processing system at an, at an enterprise. Seven manual processes, 240 hours a month. So that is six person weeks where everybody where everything gets done, or, you know, where everybody's working all 40 hours, or more likely it's eight person weeks where everybody's working 30 hours, okay? Um, so we, we now look at this now, and again, 240 hours a month, but it's still only 90% accurate. Now, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna automate these five steps in the middle here. They're manual, repetitive steps, and then we're gonna let humans do this. And now looking at this, you can see that we now have uh, two manual processes. And since we've cut those five manual processes out, uh, and they're now getting done by computers, it only takes 20 hours a month. So it is less than one person week versus eight person weeks. 
in the previous, uh, like we had in the previous item there. So again, these five things have now been automated with RPA tools. They're going to get supervised by humans. Okay, so the people aren't gone from the process, but the job the people have is going to be very different. So instead of picking up, instead of doing the data entry themselves by typing it in, what they're going to do instead is they're going to be like digital plumbers, connecting things up, troubleshooting the leaks, you know, the data, the points that don't make sense or the things that look unusual. Um, and so they're going to be more troubleshooting and fixing and less uh, going through and doing uh, less of the uh, less of the uh, actual entry. So uh, we do need to look at these are this is a range of some of the robotic process automation tools. Um, these are all available. I've actually used personally uh, Bonita Soft and Automation Anywhere. Both of those have community editions. So if you want to play with this and see what it's see what they look like, you can download these for free. They'll let you do simple tasks for free. My task I automated. I took data out of a spreadsheet, had it key it into a website, um, and it worked very very effectively. Um, so you know that's out here. I will tell you also that. Uh, that uh, there are companies out there like Vic.ai and Botkeeper that are trying to automate much of the bookkeeping process. So hey, Brian, the I just wanted to, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to interject with um, asking the third poll question because sure. that uh, you just mentioned the uh, robotic processing automation tools. Sure. Um, so I think that's a good, good time to ask the audience uh, the third poll question here, which is, is your firm using or experimenting with any RPA tools? Um, so the four answers here are, yes, we're experimenting with RPA, we're interested but haven't started, we're not interested and haven't started, and huh, what's RPA? So I hope that's not your answer because we just went through it on the slides, but uh, we will see what the answers are there. So we're just going to give a couple seconds here for the uh, uh, polling question. And Brian, when you mentioned uh, Excel macros, uh, both myself and Sharon, who is also on the call uh, in the background here, got very excited. We're big fans of Excel macros here. If they had a if they had a concert, Sharon and I would would buy tickets in the first row. We're we're big fans of Excel macros. Be up there with your up there with your lighter, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> Well, and I, think, I think you'll find these tools very interesting because they really they really let you go past uh, what you can do with macros where you're really just limited to ingesting data and cleaning it up and so forth. Um, you know, an example of something that's almost an RPA tool or that's a, a more sophisticated tool that's in Excel now is actually a tool called Power Query. Um, also known as Git and Transform in Excel. And if you haven't explored that, it's, it's life changing. I mean, the things you can do now um, and that you can script now are, are, are unbelievable. I'm sure. Yeah, it's it, this all, all of this is so, so unique. So we're, we're, uh, we're I'm blown away by what I'm seeing in your presentation for sure. Um, all right, folks, we have about uh, just over 90 percent of people have voted here. So going once, going twice and closing it out. And let's just get those poll results real quick. So overwhelmingly, about half the people said we're interested but haven't started. 13% uh, said yes, we are experimenting with robotic processing uh, automation. 19% uh, said we're not interested. And 17% uh, asked what's RPA? Well, I guess we're going to get more information on that as we go forward. And the fourth uh, polling question today will be on those bots that uh, Brian was talking about. So Brian, take it away. Yeah, so, so as we look at what bots can do, these are real, I've, I've put it on here, some real bots that exist today that you can license uh, from these things. And it will do things like uh, manage your supplier address book for AP, uh, create new, new AP supplier profiles, uh, set up the products and services, um, remove products and services, uh, maintain the supplier contact directory management and do and do payments. These are all things that can be done. Now, notice they're doing this inside of Oracle, which is an enterprise application, okay? So, you know, I, I, in that previous question I asked, many of you said, I'm interested, but I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything, but I'm interested. And that's where you ought to be right now. You ought to be thinking about it and trying to figure out how you can automate things. But you also need to know that right now, the stuff hasn't filtered its way down to things. So the people I hear talking about bots all the time are, you know, top 25 firms or top 100 firms that have strong IT capabilities. Uh, this is something that's coming of age. So here's another one. Here's a digital SAP account, accounts payable clerk. And again, you can look at these in the Automation Anywhere bot store where they actually, people license bots that you can use to accomplish tasks. Here's a digital Oracle general ledger administrator. Okay, 
Um, now, uh, so with these bots, they're pre-built by somebody else. Um, you can also create these by yourself though. So in here, we can do this by writing code and using APIs. Well, that's not you and me, most of us. Um, but um, we look at this now, we can also use recording tools similar to Excel auto record macros. So it'll watch what you do, it'll create a script from it, and then you can take the stuff you keyed in and you can insert merge fields in it so that it takes data out of a database or out of a spreadsheet and puts it directly into those areas. And finally, we can use tools like this Automation Anywhere Workbench that are structured tools. So if we look at this one in here, you can see that I have all these Excel commands up at the top, like open spreadsheet, activate C, activate sheet, get cells, go to a specific cell, run an Excel macro. Uh, we have FTP, SFTP, so we can transfer things. We can copy files back and forth. And then notice down here, we have loops, so we can do things over and over again. So if we've got things, if we got 500 things that need to be entered, we can say, do this until you're out of rows in this Excel sheet. Uh, so those are the kinds of things, again, that can be automated in here. So it's a very powerful technology. Uh, we can do things like pull Excel data from Excel or CSV, enter it in a web page. We can extract structured data from PDF files. We can enter data into Windows applications or watch, watch a folder or data file for additions and kick off a workflow. You know, we've actually got something kind of like that uh, when you upload, when you use Cloud Cabinet and you, you put stuff into a folder in, in your application, it automatically gets uploaded. Those kinds of things are out there uh, that you can use. You can route transactions and again, create emails from data with inputs. Now, there are a lot of bots out there, and um, again, when you think about these, uh, that we can automate tasks and that can be bad. And that's why, for example, uh, many times when you log into a website, you have to click on one of those things that says, please click on all the pictures that include a, um, that include a traffic light or a picture of a bicycle or a picture of a car or something like that, uh, because they're trying to keep people, keep hackers that are using robotic process automation from, try, from uh, going in and reuse, you know, and trying to hack into people's websites and other things like that. Uh, we, you know, we have a lot of a lot of uh, sites that do get attacked by bots, um, and uh, you know, again, I think uh, QuickBooks Online, I think, was actually down yesterday, and I haven't heard why, but I, I feel pretty confident that it was it probably had something to do with some kind of bot attack against it. Uh, people use bots to buy up good seats for con for tickets, uh, for concerts. Um, they'll, they'll have uh, tools that'll play massive multiplayer online role-playing games uh, that will try to earn things and get gold you can use to buy things. Um, have bots that increase views for YouTube videos and all kinds of other pieces in here. Um, now, what this means to accountants is that you have a lot of different tools out there that are starting to be used. Uh, Hilton's Connie is a virtual concierge. You have Sage's Peg uh, that lets you do chatbot-based in data entry. Uh, Zoho's Zia, BotKeeper. Uh, again, we, we've got BotKeeper and Vic.ai both uh, say that they're going to have big announcements in the very linear future. The thing I would say here is that I've not heard anybody saying they're making stupid money off of those tools yet. Okay, so you know we have that uh, Slick Pie and MagicBot AI that's an automatic receipt data entry tool, um, and then there are a lot of different Slack bots. So these things, again, uh, there's a lot of integrations that can be done in here, uh, a lot of tools you can use. Uh, Facebook, there's some Facebook Messenger bot builders and there are bot connections you can have for Office 365 Outlook in there. Um, and again, just check out those links. There's a lot of things, that, again, that can be done. Um, again, that can be done within there. Uh, Brian, let's do that fourth polling question because it has to do with um, maybe uh, some of our uh, attendees that are listening are accountants and they may want to answer mm -hmm. the do you think your clients would use a chat bot to enter data and images uh, yes assuming it was integrated with SMS and Facebook Messenger uh, yes and they're asking for this functionality no that's a little too techy for my client base and maybe but I'd have to look at it first so once again folks this is the fourth of five polling questions that we have during the presentation today so you wouldn't mind uh, answering that. Yeah, I mean, the thought process behind this is we're we're trying to take the front end on applications now and let people let people meet meet them where they are. 
So if you have something, if you have, let's say, an invoice in front of you, you want to take a picture of it, um, you know, you could potentially SMS it in or email it in, um, you know, or you could, you know, and again, that's not nearly as secure as what you can do with accounting power today with doing direct upload. But again, the chatbot's an interesting methodology for entering data, and um, it's a, uh, you know, it's it's something that that I'm not sure if people are going to do it or not, but it's um, it's pretty thought provoking nonetheless, Tom. How, how long would it take to to add, you know, a sort of a chatbot chatbot function, excuse me, uh, into uh, that sort of standalone? You know, software, bookkeeping software. Would, would would how much long? How long would that take? And how long do you think estimated would clients have to uh, get to adjust to something like that? Well, the trick to it. Well, there's there's two tricks there. One trick is that you have to you have to take the in the chatbot. You have to make the you have to plot out the whole discussion you have. And you would obviously start out with something that would just do very very limited tasks. Like maybe you you just go in there and you say, what do you want to do? Uh, enter a bill, and then it would take you through and say, "Okay, now attack, now enter the picture and and send it to me. Now put, now who's it for? Now what's the amount? Now what's the date?" And then it could take the date and put that in there. Um, you know, I think you'd have to ask the the programmers and the tools how long it would take to do that. But there are some chatbots that can be created um, with very little very little programming required. Uh, Interesting. Again, Ro rolling it out to clients is a whole different kettle of fish because anytime you roll anything out to a client, you have to make three sales. Okay, uh, the the partner has to be sold that it's the right idea. Then the people actually doing the work for the firm have to be sold it's the right idea and it's the right thing to do. And then the client has to be sold that it's the right thing. Okay, so so you got to be very far down the road of trusting it before you do that. So if I was going to do that, I'd start out by having the firm do it uh, for internal use and then and only then let uh, let clients interact with it after you've gotten all the bugs out of it. Got it. That makes perfect sense. All right, let's uh, close the polling question out now and let's quickly share those results. Uh, so uh, Brian, about half of our uh, attendees today said maybe, uh, but I'd have to look at it first. 30% said it's too techie for their client base. Um, and then 10% uh, of respondents uh, for both, yes, assuming it integrated with SMS, and yes, they are asking for this functionality. Yeah, and, and that's a big generational difference we have uh, because I'm Gen X like many of you are. I was born in 1968, and um, I know that um, natively I don't think – you know, my the way my son uses technology is very different than the way I do because I came up having to stare at a computer to do things. He wants to do everything on his mobile phone. So as we're thinking about this, we have to remember that there are people like my son that when they were eight years old, they had a mobile phone. So their perception of how technology works is different. So why wouldn't we have to make adjustments to make it work for them? Uh, anyway. But that's uh, that's a little bit about uh, RPA and bots. Now, next thing we're going to look at is artificial intelligence, and this is where we're. This is once we've gotten a whole bunch of structured data off of our process tracking systems and other things like that, and now we start trying to mine it to do machine learning, and then we go in and we actually create logic with it uh, that that mimics uh, problem solving that we have. Okay, uh, so we you know things like human speech, autonomous cars, interpreting complex data like images and videos and other pieces like that. Again, as AI becomes more capable, the tasks that used to be considered AI, like optical character recognition, are just accepted that they work. Uh, you know, uh, you think about how much Alexa and Siri and Google Voice have changed over the years, and they they really have gotten so much better at interpreting, at interpreting what you're doing and going forward. Now, uh, there are some risks associated with AI, uh, devaluation of, of humanity, decrease in demand for human labor, uh, artificial moral agents, super intelligence, robot rights, all kinds of other crazy things. You know, there are, I think about all the all the movies out there that have taken on this subject, you know, Her by that Spike Jones directed, or, um, you know, iRobot, or, you know, many, many others who you could quote. Uh, so again, there's this artificial intelligence thing is, a, is something that needs to be considered. 
Now, it's not new though. It started back in 1956 at Dartmouth. Um, it is, again, normally divided into things like robotics and machine learning. We typically have goals like reasoning, knowledge, planning, learning, natural language processing, perception, explainability. Did you know that when you, when you call the airline hotlines, uh, they listen to everything that's going on in the background while you're on hold, even though you're hearing that intolerable music. And if you use some of the seven words that can't be said on television, you're often often routed to as somebody that's that's used to deal that gets paid more to deal with people that are irate. So they actually route people differently depending on uh, what's said. So you know, again, you may actually by swearing in the background, you may actually make it make your wait longer because you have to wait for one of those specialists instead of being able to go to the next ready person. Uh, now, when we look at what AI solved, um, you know, beat the world chess champion, beat uh, Ken Jennings at Jeopardy, beat the world champion at Go. Those are all three savant tasks, okay? So we've not had anybody in there that's able to replace a psychiatrist or psychologist or uh, been able to do other things. Uh, we have AI, believe it or not, that's used in France. Most of the music that's used, that's, that's, um, that's on in the background in French TV shows actually is, is computer composed as opposed to human, human composed. Now I'm gonna skip over some of these other pieces in here and, and I wanna to get to practicality. So what's it mean? Well, we have tools like Zoho's Intelligent Assistant and Zoho CRM uh, that will do things like tell you the best time to contact somebody. Uh, so it'll actually look at when you were successful reaching them and it'll look at email sentiment analysis and see whether those emails tend to be happy or not. Uh, tools like MindBridge for auditing or financial services tools like MoneyStream or Kazisco. Uh, there are HR tools, Salesforce tools and uh, tools in Salesforce or even self-writing applications out there. Now, one of the things that's been really big for any money laundering uh, because it affects banks and the banks, of course, have the money to spend on this is going to be any money laundering where they're analytically looking at uh, transaction patterns and trying to uh, trying to find things out of there. So many of the things that you see that will affect accounting are going to, again, come through there. Um, we look at some of our AI applications, uh, you know, things like creating stories and music and self-driving vehicles and finance and economics. Uh, you look at healthcare uh, in here with surgery with the ro autonomous robots, okay? Um, I've had robotic surgery before where a human was directing it, but what if the robot was just doing the surgery on their own, okay? That might be a bridge too far for you, uh, but that's something that is maybe not so far along here. Uh, we've also seen uh, um, applications like Watson's uh, AI tools for diagnosing leukemias that may change actually the way that uh, images get read and make uh, radiologists somewhat obsolete. Uh, so, you know, again, or, or change the way they work. So we're not the only ones potentially getting disrupted in here. Now, if we look at this for CPAs, we have a lot of different uh, alternatives here for them. We have tools like Inflow, Teammate Analytics, MindBridges AI Auditor, SureLink. Um, you have the AI CPA OnPoint, um, uh, you know, Casework Cloud, many others in there. As we look at this, Inflow, for example, is a tool that automates the import uh, normalization and then analysis of data sets. Uh, so, this, so this actually goes through and, and works with it, um, works with Thompson's audit tools. Uh, we have tools like uh, CCH Audit Accelerator, uh, also known as, my, also known as um, uh, this one is, oh, and I'm blanking out right now, uh, Validus, that's what it is. Uh, but uh, this will actually extract data from a number of different general ledger systems, create standardized schedules, and then uh, put them into CCH engagement so you can work with it. This works today, okay? So you can buy this today. Um, and again, you have tools that will do that. Um, you have automation tools that help you do 100% testing and help you uh, help you identify the right fields and will actually train your staff how to work with things. So as you uh, think about the test you have, let's just zoom in on this now and notice, you have a test library with over 100 tests. These are some of the tests that you might need to run. And then within there, you actually have descriptions in the help. So it shows you the different pieces and the different tools uh, that you could, you, you could work with. Okay, so notice that they've got this stuff all defined and worked through. Um, they also have nice looking charts and presentations of data that you can use as you're, as you're trying to go through and work with it in here. 
Now, another thing that's that again is changing things is um, is that you know we think about the trends affecting advisory in particular. One of the big advantages of doing bookkeeping uh, for clients is that you get to see the advisory opportunities in real time, as opposed to having to wait till after the year is over, like a lot of other people do. So it gives all of you that do client bookkeeping and client payroll a huge strategic advantage over um, over people that are over the accounting firms that just do the audit or just do the annual tax return, uh, because you can see the stuff before they can uh, because you're looking at it every month every week in some cases every day uh, so so again as we as we think about this now uh, those are out here now another piece that we need to look at here is going to be CAS and tax and so as you're thinking about this I want you to think about extraction tools like receipt bank and auto entry okay um, the reason I want you to think about them is because they will take things like bank statements and credit card statements and invoices and bills and they'll extract the data and put it into a structured format so you can then clean it up and import it into applications certainly the superior approach is to use bank feeds uh, like you can with uh, with accountants world but in some cases where you don't have them or maybe you're having to go back and do work from five years ago when where for which you can't get bank feeds uh, these kind of tools again become very helpful in here uh, also for receipt capture and other pieces. But again, the idea is that you extract the data using a mobile app, you streamline it by unlocking capabilities, and then you turn around and optimize it with some analysis insight and reports. Um, data can be input by mobile app. Uh, so you, there's actually a receipt bank mobile app where you can just take a picture of a receipt or a bill, put it in there, it will extract the data from it, like the invoice date, amount, and um, vendor. And then uh, you can take that and then interface it in uh, by either interfacing if it's something that directly interfaces or by uh, exporting it to CSV or Excel, then importing it into your application. Uh, you can email data into there, you can direct upload, or they have a thing called auto fetch. This is, this is really cool. Uh, I actually use this with Amazon and with my bank and credit cards. Uh, it will actually automatically retrieve every time I buy something on Amazon. So in addition to me being able to go back to Amazon and print out the stuff from within Amazon, this thing will automatically retrieve it and put it in my box account in a specific folder. So, so you have all kinds of things like this that, that will save you a lot of time potentially that you should consider. Uh, Fetch again works with more than 2,000 and well more than 2,000 suppliers because I know this is an ancient presentation, uh, but uh, again, they've got a lot of different partners they work with. Um, again, the idea behind this is to, again, automate much of the processing of these documents so that you can go forward and to make it possible for you to, again, uh, go through and, and let the technology work for you instead of you working to maintain the technology. Okay. Um, Anyway, gives you some of the some of the pieces in there. Uh, now, that's the um, those are the major things I had, guys. Uh, do you want to do the last? You want me to close out or do the polling question first? Let's do the final polling question, and then you can close out, and we'll take uh, any questions from uh, the audience. I'm sure that they'll have something. If anybody has any questions regarding the material, uh, please feel free to fill those out in the questions tab, uh, and we will go to the final polling question right now. Uh, are you using any OCR data extraction tools for CAS, receipt bank, auto entry, et cetera? Yes, uh, we're actively using uh, extraction tools. No, but we're considering these tools. No, and we're not ready for them yet. And no, uh, but we'd like to learn more. So we will get uh, the last of the responses in here. We have about 80% of you have voted. It looks to be a pretty mixed bag coming in, Brian. So that'll be uh, something, a, a quick talking point for us here. Well, these things are, you know, it's still a little bit early on these things. Uh, you know, they're, they've been around for a while. They've been used in the rest of the world because the rest of the world has value added tax and they have, to re they have to retrieve data off there. We're just a little bit behind in the U.S. because we don't have that same compliance requirement that causes us to adopt them. So they are ready for prime time. They just haven't become as popular. 
Right. And I'm sure that it will, you know, we had for our last expert webinar presentation, um, Hitendra Patel, who works uh, with us here at Accountants World, gave a, a terrific presentation on client accounting services. Um, so, you know, it's really great that you're bringing some of these data extraction tools that you can use for CAS to light. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what everybody has to say about that. So and I will uh, say I love having those conversations with Hitendra because I think he's one of the best thinkers in the profession. Um, about how to solve problems for CAS, uh, because again, he's he's living it every day, trying to help uh, you know you you guys uh, you know and and your team at Accountants World um, solve those problems. So I'm I'm a big fan of Atendra. As am I. Uh... So let's uh, close out the polling response here. We have about uh, a little over 90% of people have voted. So we'll close it out and let's share those results with everybody. Uh, so it's a pretty even split. 26% uh, said yes, we are actively using. 28% uh, said no, but we're considering. 28% uh, said no, we're not ready for them yet. 19% said no, we'd like to learn more. So very kind of even split on the way that our attendees feel about uh, these tools. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you. It's it's one of those things again. This is an example of one of the technologies that's ready because it's been uh, they've shaken it down in the rest of the world, and now you just have to figure out how to make it work with what you want to do. Um, and it's a um, it's a very appealing, uh, fairly mature technology uh, that you can use today. So I would encourage you to spend some time checking it out, see what you think you want to do here. Uh, the good news is that Accountants World is architected where you can import transactions very easily into it. Uh, so you should be able to digest the data with those things and then bring it in pretty very easily in, in there uh, without having to key it in a second time. Now, when we look at this, uh, I want to remind you that, again, there are a lot of efforts being made to process data into meaningful information. Some of them are things like receipt capture, receipt data extraction, where, they, you know, again, I, or I take pictures of all my receipts when I'm traveling, and it, the data automatically gets extracted and entered, entered in by expense management software. Um, you know, a lot of these technologies have not quite made it to the mainstream, especially here in the U.S., because we don't have the compliance requirement of getting the VAT number for everybody we pay VAT to for every month. So we don't have to have the discipline. But the good news is they've worked out, all, they've shaken out all the bugs with that and expense reporting tools now where it works well. We will work differently in the future. Okay, we will be dealing more with digital plumbing and more with robotic uh, robotic automation, but there will still be problems. Bank feeds will break from time to time, and we'll have to know how to import things and make it work. Um, you know, again, when we moved to computerized ledgers and electronic documentation, we had things that had to be worked out. We worked them out, figured them out, and went forward. Finally, there are a lot of business benefits in here to using some of these emerging technologies. You know, I'm going to encourage you, you don't have to go to the extent of Google where you allow somebody to work one day a week on mad science projects. Uh, you know, 20% is probably too much, but you need to allow people to experiment with new technologies and, uh, and, have, and pilot them so that you can learn what you don't know about them before you start making decisions. Again, you don't know what you don't know, and there are a lot of great tools out there that can, again, in the long run, after you've mastered them, uh, can save you a lot of time and effort uh, going forward. So thanks for letting me come here today, Tom and, and Div. I appreciate the opportunity. And folks, if I can help you, I'm Brian at K2E.com. Uh, thanks for coming, and I wish you all a very successful uh, rest of 2020 and a very prosperous 2021. Thanks so much, Brian. Uh, before we uh, take off here, we have about... Uh, Four, three to four minutes here, so we have we'll, we'll get a couple questions in. Uh, Craig asked for firms that do not have technology departments, how do we go about evaluating the multitude of products uh, to find those that fit our practices and processes? It, it can be a little bit overwhelming, Craig. Uh, Brian, do you have a, a a best practice for that? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, read reviews. So uh, you can we do reviews at CPA firm CPA firm software .com, which is a K2 website. Um, C, uh, CPA practice advisor still does reviews. I wrote a couple hundred of those over the years. Um, the other thing to do is talk to your peers about what works and what doesn't and ask them open-ended questions like, why did you pick this over that? Uh, what do you think, what did you think of this one versus that one? And, you know, again, I, I'm going to tell you that, you know, if you're if you're not out lunching with a client doing marketing like you ought to be, um, you know, you ought to 
you ought to go in and uh, you ought to be going in and um, and taking webinars at lunch if you can uh, to learn more about these solutions because the only way you're going to learn about them is to is to have is to interact with them. Tom. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, Brian. Uh, let's get a couple more questions in here. Um, uh, Joe asked, "Do you have any experience with Botkeeper, and if so, what are your impressions on that?" I have zero experience with Botkeeper, so I can't speak to it. Um, I know that um, I have a friend that's at a top hundred firm or top twenty-five firm, I guess, uh, who's starting a pilot with them. Uh, he's already running some tests, some some tests with Vic.ai. I will say that I've not heard, it, I've not had a person come up to me and say, "I'm making stupid money with Botkeeper now." Okay, so. You know, I, I think that it's something where you'd have to take a, uh, you know, you'd have to try it out and see how it works. You know, and if you if it goes out there early, you might be you might be able to get a strategic advantage over everybody else that's going to wait. Uh, so, you know, again, it's risk return. Uh, but, you know, I've I know there are a lot of sharp folks over there. I mean, I, I respect uh, Jody Paydar and Byron Patrick and the folks that I know that are over there. So I'm sure they're doing, I'm sure they're, they're getting closer uh, to automated accounting, just like, you know, the, just like Todd that's over at Vic.ai. I'm, I'm convinced that they're making progress. I just don't know exactly where they are in the process at this point. Uh, very good. And our, our, our look, what our last question will be here and uh, the, just as, as sounding as impartial as possible, uh, what is Brian's recommendation on a best of breed solution for putting together a CAS offering? You know, I think you got to get the payroll right and you got to get the GL right and you got to get them where they'll talk to each other. I think you've got to decide, uh, you know, I think you got to, you got to get them, you got to get those pieces where they work together and you need to have an option where you can either have client assisted accounting or complete outsourced, or you can do things like write up. And I'll be honest with you, um, I don't know of anybody else that does it better than Accountants World uh, as far as having the full integrated piece. I mean, payroll relief's a strong product. Um, you know, the way they've got the workflows for doing payables is, a, is, a, is strong. They integrate with strategic partners to pull in, uh, pull in uh, bank transactions and to do electronic payments. I mean, they're... They're living, breathing, smoking, trying to make a better, a better mousetrap every day. And um, I think you ought to look at what they're doing, folks, because um, there aren't a lot of great uh, CAS platforms out there. And uh, certainly there's not one, you know, you start looking at some of the offerings from some competitors where they're doing client bookkeeping services now and client payroll services now. You know, it's nice to have a partner that's not going to compete with you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. Uh, it was a terrific presentation as always. I'm going to take back uh, the uh, presenter controls here. Uh, just give me one second as I go do that. All righty. And uh, let's uh, see here. Uh, all right, folks. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Brian, your, like I said, your presentation was terrific as always. Um, one of the things that we want to let you know about is our next ed expert webinar presentation. Uh, it features Jana Etienne. She is talking about moving beyond notice, driving meaningful change to foster inclusion, equity, and belonging. Uh, we've had Jana uh, on uh, for the past two years now for our expert webinar series, and she is a dynamic presenter uh, and a, a brilliant woman, and she's a just terrific. I, I, I love hearing her presentations and her perspective. Um, her uh, presentation will be on Wednesday, October 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you're interested in signing up for the rest of the webinars this year, you can do so at 2020-webinars.com. 2020-webinars.com. And if you have any uh, questions about uh, anything Accountants World webinar related, please email us at webinar at accountantsworld.com. So thank you so much for everybody uh, who joined us today. Brian, thank you so much again. Well, thank you. Thank you, Tom. It's always an honor to be included. And uh, again, wish everybody a, a successful rest of 2020. And let's, uh, let's look forward to shutting the door on 2020 and moving forward in 2021. Yeah, I hear that. I hear that. So, <laughs> all right, folks, thank you so much. Take care.